I read nine books in April. One was a reread, one was a new-to-me author, and seven were new-to-me books by authors I'd read before. Two were books from my massive TBR shelf. Regarding authors, eight were written by a woman. The ninth was a graphic novel illustrated by a woman. One book was written by an author of color, and four books were written by a queer author. Regarding main characters, four books had at least one woman, four had at least one POC, and five had at least one queer character. Three of the books I read were graphic novels. I DNF'd one book. The primary genre spread was four romance, three sci-fi fantasy, and two contemporary. It was a really good reading month for me. I gave most of the books four stars or higher. One book got three stars, and one got two stars. I finally finished the Special Delivery Contemporary Romance series by Heidi Cullinan. I had read the first two books years ago, but remember pretty much nothing other than I loved them. I reread book one, Special Delivery, earlier this year and gave it four out of five stars. I had originally given it five stars, but this time around I disconnected slightly for a couple reasons. One, although it was clear the main character was neighbor in danger, the story told the consent line of a kink I don't relate to personally. I have to emphasize, though, that Cullinan is one of my favorite authors because she's a master at portraying what a character's kink means to them, even if the reader doesn't relate to it themselves. The second disconnect was that the story is told from the perspective of a college-aged main character figuring out his romance and sexual desires, and this is an age group and conflict I've since grown out of. I did reread the first book in audio, and I thought the narrator made Randy sound too slimy to like him as a protagonist, so I read the rest of the books in print. Book 1.5, Hooch and Cake, is when I really started to fall in love with Randy as a character. This novella focuses on Sam and Mitch's wedding and is just so sweet and meaningful. Another of Cullinan's strengths is the relationship building between characters, both romantic and platonic. Their support for each other shines brightest throughout the whole series, and especially in this story. I definitely teared up several times and gave it 4.5 stars. Book 2, Double Blind, is my favorite in the series. There's a light sense of danger which makes the plot and character arcs that much more rewarding without crossing too much into angst territory. It's probably the sexiest of the series, just scorchingly hot. Frankly, it's worth a read just for the sheer wonder of watching a bunch of grown-ass men continuously lose it over kittens with zero question or threat to their masculinity. I gave it five stars. Book 2.5, The Twelve Days of Randy, is a sweet holiday-themed novella. It's not quite as cohesive as the previous stories in the series. One scene seemed like obvious filler, and I didn't quite understand all the dynamics between Ethan and Crabtree. But the characters in Randy's struggle to match his holiday wishes with the expectations other have of him still made it a great read. I gave it four stars. The last published book in the series, Tough Love, was my least favorite. It centers on two new characters in the Mitch, Sam, Randy social circle, although those characters are very much present. It was very different in tone from the previous stories, where the sense of danger and angst overshadow their romantic aspects. My biggest problem was the skirting of a mental health issue. In the end, Kalinan tried to morph it into, oh, it's actually not a mental health issue, in a very messy and not well-handled bow so that the main couple could have their happily ever after. It's not what I expected of the author. Trigger warning here for suicide, and I should also note a trigger warning for double blind for suicidal thoughts, although it's not nearly as prominent in that book. The kinks practiced by the main characters in Tough Love are definitely not my things, but again, Cullinan did a fantastic job of making it clear what the kinks meant to the characters and demanding respect for those kinks. Also, as usual, and my favorite aspect of this book is the found family among the main characters. Everyone's instant acceptance of Chenko and Caramella, Chenko's drag queen persona, is beautiful, as is their desire to help in healthy, very explicitly consent-driven ways. The relationships are powerful because they are so focused on consent and communication, and I wish more books presented relationships, especially between men, this way. Overall, I gave the book three stars. Moving on to the other books I read in April. Over the years, I've collected several of the St. Germain vampire novels by Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough, and finally read the first one, Hotel Transylvania. It takes place in 18th century France and revolves around stopping a demonic cult operating at the fringes of society. It's not a masterpiece for me, although I fully recognize that as a 1978 publication, it in part birthed the current genre of vampire stories, and the author has won many deserved awards for her fiction. The lush, detailed historical world pulled me in, and I enjoyed it. I love Madeleine's character and was excited to learn that there are two books focused on her. The end turned gruesome, but that made the ultimate destruction of the antagonist even more satisfying. I will eventually continue the series and gave this book four stars. The book I DNF'd was The Namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri. 
It's not a bad book, it's just not for me, and if anyone has seen my picture of my TBR pile on Litzy, you'll know I just don't have time to finish books I'm just not into when I have so many others to get to. This is the second Lahiri book I was neutral about, The Other Interpreter of Maladies. The way the narrative is told in a very detached manner doesn't work for me. There's not much by way of plot in favor of heavy introspection, which didn't capture me. I will say that the details of the different cultures, foods, and experiences are told beautifully, and I understand why people do like this book. I rated it two stars. I finished the Wires and Nerve graphic novel sequels to The Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. I stayed up way past when I should have to finish it. I loved it so much. The second volume was a great conclusion, and I adore how distinct each character's personality is. The whole series, including the novels, has some of the best friendships I've read. I originally gave this book 4.5 stars, but the more I reflected on the plot in the following days, the more of one particular event bothered me. I can't go into details because of spoilers, but it was enough for me to knock down my rating to 4 stars. I'll go into spoilery details at the end of the video so that anyone who doesn't want to be spoiled can exit out. My other 5 star read of the month was Herding Cats by Sarah Anderson. It's the third comic collection she's published, and I've loved every single one. I smiled the whole time. At one point, I was crying with laughter. It is actually physically painful how relatable Sarah Anderson's comics are. Seeing one in a picture is one thing, but the experience of turning the page and finding more of myself on each page just builds into a phenomenal read. Also, the mini personal essay at the end is wonderfully told. I highly recommend all of her work. Lastly, I read Saga Volume 8, written by Brian K. Vaughn and illustrated by Fiona Staples. So after the emotional beating that was Volume 7, it was great but not happy. We needed a wind down, and Volume 8 provided that. It still dealt with issues and fallout from the previous volume, but not in quite a heart-wrenching manner. My criticisms would be that the story lost a bit of cohesion at the end, and Sir Robot seems to be turning more one-dimensional than he started out at the beginning of the series. Overall, this series is incredible at meaningful storytelling and stunning, often shocking artwork, starting right off on page one for this volume. Petrichor is awesome. Saga was my gateway comic into graphic novels, and I highly recommend it. I gave this volume four stars. It's everything I read in April. Let me know in the comments if you read any of these books and what your thoughts on them are. The rest of this video is going to be a spoiler section, so if you don't want to know what happens yet, be sure to exit out now. Thanks for joining me. Okay, this is the spoiler section, so don't continue if you don't want spoilers. I'll be elaborating on what I didn't like about Wires and Nerve Volume 2. So it was foreshadowed pretty early in Volume 1 that Aiko would have her chip broken since Cress makes a copy, but it doesn't happen until nearly the end of Volume 2, and that's nearly the plot of both volumes Aiko forgets when her original chip is destroyed. She doesn't get that back, and there was a lot of character and relationship development loss that's just kind of glossed over as a result. I thought it was strange for the main character to lose that development, whether she's an android or not. It's like watching a movie or reading a book only to find out in the end everything's a dream. It's disappointing. I get that the other characters grew, but the story focuses on her and she's reset back to nearly the beginning of it. I'm still processing that aspect of it, but overall, again, I really did like the story. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for joining.